I feel I feel clearly that this season can be mine, so uh, I will do everything I can to, to finalize that. The number three takes victory in race one, an epic win. MX on 74, the burst into life here in Manchester. It's going to be a very interesting first turn. Then Kyroli around the outside, and uh, he and Coronel both go down. Yeah, everything was going good, and then I had one one big mistake. And... Oh, Ben Watson! Off the side of the bike, and Italy are going to be crowned world champions. The WMX class often struggles for hype and attention. That changed when Courtney Duncan came into the picture. Before Duncan had even stepped foot onto an MXGP track, there was hype, excitement, talk about just how good she is and how good she can be. And she backed all of that up by going 1-1 in her first WMX event. So I got my first bike when I was seven years of age. And at that point, it was kind of, you know, just a hobby and something I did because my friends did. And it wasn't until I was about 12 or 13, I caught it on TV at the time in New Zealand. We had some pretty big superstars like Catherine Prom, Josh Coppins, Ben Townley overseas, killing it on the world stage. And from that point, it probably, you know, twisted my arm and made me think that's what I want to do. One day I'm, you know, going to be in that position and one day I'm going to be going for a world title. And surely enough, you know, 10, 15 years later, here I am. So Duncan now in second position and going after Olivia Lancelot. Well, there's been a lot of uh, hype around this young 20-year-old from the South Island in New Zealand. Around the outside, good drive there, and goes through the inside. Great move there from Courtney Duncan, who now leads at the end of the fourth lap, and she goes past Lydia Lancelot. Will she be able to get her head down here now and take off at the front of the field? Final turn, checkered flag, about to be raised for the first time of the year, and Courtney Duncan picks up 25 points Wins moto number one here in Qatar. Get ready to go racing for the second time here. WMX race two, round one in Qatar. So Duncan leads away here on the very first lap in WMX race two. 151, the JCR Yamaha rider from New Zealand makes it a perfect evening here in Qatar. She double moto wins here at the opening round and that is a big win for her. Oh, it's bittersweet right now. I, um, I'm over the moon. It's been a tough week and uh, coming in you don't know what to expect. It's the first time I've ever been to a GP led and known race one so uh, just stoked to be able to be here and I couldn't have done it without obviously my family, my dad's here, well stepdad's here and he's been unbelievable this week. Uh, everyone over home has been just behind me so much. Obviously my team I raced Courtney when she was on a, or I first saw her ride when she was on a 65 and uh, she lined up in a, in a women's race in Christchurch in New Zealand and um, at that time I was leading all of the championships and winning everything so yeah she wasn't competitive because she was on a 65, I think I was on a 125 or a 250F and uh, but I do remember watching her ride and thinking she, she's something special. Actually, her last name, obviously, Courtney Duncan, and she used to have short little hair and looked like a little boy, and we used to think, is it Courtney Duncan or Duncan Courtney? So that was like the inside joke. And um, But yeah, she's actually now the way she rides in Europe is probably at 80% or 70% of her ability because she just wants to finish races now after losing all those championships uh, due to just bad luck, you know, like she's had a photographer walk in front of her and... Oh, here. Uh, oh we've got to... Oh, Duncan! Duncan, our race leader, is down! And she's taking a hit, trying to sort her visor out on the helmet. Yeah, the girls cut the track one year and... <laughs> it, yeah, it's been a disaster. And then, yeah, she was made to race an MX2 race in France and, and broke her foot without even crashing. So she's lost a lot of titles through bad luck. Um, and now she, she kind of just does everything she can to stay on the bike and, and win the titles rather than go all out there. But when she rides at 100% without worrying about anything else or looking at the bigger picture, she's, I, I think, even five, six, seven seconds a lap faster. She rides that much toned back now. So that, like if, when she sets the fastest lap time in time practice in, in the women's class this year, we know she can do that lap every single lap. That's not one fast lap, that's her pace. 
When Courtney Duncan finally won a WMX championship in 2019, it wasn't a case of being excited and surprised. It was more of a case of being like, finally, because everyone in the paddock knew that Duncan was deserving of a WMX title. Misfortune just kept standing in her way. And she is the 2019 FIM Motocross World Champion. And finally, she's done it. And I'm lost for words, just, it's indescribable. Like to, I come out and I won my first race and man, I expected to big things out of myself and, and everyone around me also. And I just had, I just had to take my time and, and learn from all these mistakes and failures. And when we felt like quitting, we kept going and here we are, world champion. So when she finally got it done in 2019, it was more of a sigh of relief for everyone there that finally this impressive, amazing rider has got the job done. Duncan is similar to Jeffrey Hurlings in a lot of ways, where when she is healthy, when she is at her best, few people in the world think she can be beaten to a championship. And we've seen that now in 2019, 2020. Here is Duncan, the number one DRT Kawasaki. Third is enough to be crowned world champion for a second time. Uh, this one's for, for everyone, you know, it's, you just can't do this alone, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know whether it's WMX or anything, but any world champion on a team is, is a plus if you market it right. You know, there's an audience for everything and, um, you know, to, for any product to be able to say, you know, they have a women's world champion is, is sort of demographically right at correct at the moment. I think it was so tough because in 2016, my first pro race, I'd already set the bar so high for myself, coming out winning on debut. And, you know, you think to yourself at the time, oh, this is going to be, you know, a little bit of a walk in the park, but you know, you're just so naive and you're so young and you have so much to learn. And I made mistakes along the way. And I'm going to be honest and put my you know hand up and say a lot of them were my own fault. Um, just made stupid mistakes at costly times and in the end they, they cost me race wins and cost me points and ultimately that cost me championships so I think I just had a lot of growing up to do but it definitely tested me a lot, it tested the resilience and there was times when I lay in bed especially after losing that first World Cup with the injury and thinking do I want to do this, do I want to keep going but um, looking back at it yeah, I'm definitely glad I did and it's just something that you have to persevere with the time and learn from the lessons and I can think I can say it, it all paid off. Check out those lines in the site in Lapke because there is a lot more, there's a few different lines that they weren't taking in practice and you can go inside a little bit more, even coming along the pit lane straight as well, they're going quite far out and you can come in a bit more here. You know one thing about Courtney is she sort of rides, you know you wouldn't know if she was a guy, you know she, she sort of you know, her corner speed and the way she sort of floats around the track is sort of pretty amazing. I'd say she has, you know, more corner speed than quite a lot of riders. But here we are, temperature 16 degrees, barely a cloud in the sky over the Dolomite Mountains here. It is the most picturesque racetrack that we have in Europe, possibly. Not having, you know, your friends and family in comfort there can be tough sometimes, especially after a bad day, especially after a bad performance. But then again, like, when I pack my bags and say goodbye to my family, you know, there's a huge purpose behind that. You know, you're flying 24 hours on the airplane to the other side of the world on your own. And I'm not just doing that to fill the gates. Like I say, I'm doing that because the purpose is to be a world champion. And I think it definitely drives me that extra bit further. You ready? No panic. No panic. Don't mind if you get bad start, nothing. Just keep it. Look what happened last week. You get a bad start and you come free to first, so. And the riders just making their way into position. Going far. You want to push or you get? Good luck. Pretty much a full line up here today. WMX, race one is underway. And that was uh, Georgia Montini. Oh, Montanese, upside down on the top of the hill. Has that pretty much decided the championship because Fontanese did not look too impressed with that move and was looking a little bit slow to get back to the bike there. So if it stays like this, Duncan will be crowned world champion for the third time. 
Courtney Duncan, though, is world champion for the third time. Well, she puts all of that to bed here, and she can celebrate as a world champion for the third successive time. What a feeling, man, to do it three times in a row, you know, with the, with the same team, the same brand is... It's amazing. Words don't describe it. The 2021 MXGP series has been phenomenal. The best ever, you could say. It could have been even better, though. We were missing a star in Jeremy Sewer. He was on track, sure, but he dealt with so many obstacles throughout the season, mainly illnesses, sickness, that just stopped him from reaching his highest level until the very end. Imagine if he had been healthy the whole time. We could have had another rider in this phenomenal five-way title fight. Yeah, it's just amazing, you know, to, you know, experience this kind of stuff, uh, doing our job, doing my job uh, as an athlete and using, you know, the free days to find some places like that and, uh, you know, find some freedom for your mind, uh, you know, uh, get some rest and really be by yourself, enjoy the view, enjoy the nature because nature has a lot of, a lot of strength, you know, uh, it's, quiet here you don't hear any noise and it's just amazing to be here and it gives me a lot of uh, mental strength and uh, calls me down clears my mind and once i hit the trails back down uh, it's back to action mode and i feel like i have uh, all the energy again to to line up on the starcade and uh, perform then we are definitely going to be spoiled by the time we leave. Five seconds. Who is it going to be that grabs that foxhole shot here? MXGP race one. Middle of the gate. It's one of the Yamahas. It's Siwa. He's got his teammate Colton off behind him. Febra's in there as well. So too Prada. Siwa leads the way by two seconds over Prado. Cold enough trying to go around the outside in third. Guy some four. The Monster Energy Yamaha rider in control right from the very first lap. Last race win was race one here, the penultimate round last year. Well, that, the gap all of a sudden coming right down. We are going to have a last lap showdown. It's only 2.2 seconds between Siwa and Fevre. Oh! Oh! Pushing too hard! Jeremy Siwa is going to take his first win of the season, his first win in a year, his 11th career race win. Jeremy Siwa, take him out. Yeah, as I said, after the first moto, you know, MXGP at the moment is tough. But those three battling for the title, they go all in, they have to. So I try to do my best and to win a GP, I'm speechless right now. I, I've never felt like this for a while and it's amazing, you know, to I won a GP last year, but it wasn't the same. Now I crossed the finish line and I knew this one is mine and it's incredible. A big thanks to all around me, especially like my mechanic. He's working day and night for me and he brought me back where I am now. And now uh, this is amazing. Thanks all of you. Remember that Maxime Renault was not even a factory rider one year ago. He had one GP win under his belt, that came in Italy in September 2020. And when he took the second GP win of his career in Great Britain in June of this year, it wasn't a surprise, but it was more a case of everyone thinking, oh, this rider can win the occasional race, the occasional Grand Prix. No one expected this to then become a regular thing. No one expected him to then become a dominant force. If anything, expectations were set at him becoming a podium regular. Quite low in comparison to what he's actually achieved and now here we are just a couple of rounds from the end of a championship and he can win his first MX2 title with two rounds to spare. And you can see everybody here enjoying the occasion here at this 16th round. Well that's 
the atmosphere continues to build. Let's take a look at the top five in the championship as we head into MX2 race two. Maxim Renault now 101 points clear of Diago Kirtz, which means if he finishes ahead of Kirtz and Vial, he can be crowned world champion here today. MX2 race two, all eyes towards the right hand side, center of the gate. And once again, Tom Vial in there, Renault to the outside. He's at the inside of his teammate, Beniston and Yago Kids in there as well. And the lead has changed hands. Renault leads on lap five. It's been a tough journey for him to overcome the injuries, the adversity, to turn it around, to continue the work hard. He can't believe it. And Maxim Renault will round out the final turn. He has realized his lifelong ambition. He is crowned MX2 World Champion, and he does it with a win, he does it with a Grand Prix victory. Maxime Renault is um, an unexpected champion, but not unexpected in the sense that no one thought he could do it. Unexpected in the sense that it happened so quickly. I don't think even Yamaha, the contracts prove it. Yamaha didn't expect him to win this soon. No one did, let alone by such a healthy margin. Winning with two rounds to spare is no joke, but that speaks to just how phenomenal he's been this year. I've been through so much tough moments and uh, really big injury uh, a couple of years ago and uh, could never even dream about that. And now uh, today I'm here, I'm world champion and uh, yeah, just could make it happen with such a great team with Yamaha Monster Energy. So it's, I'm just the happiest today. Welcome back to Italy for the final round of the FIM Motocross World Championship. It's round 18. It's taken a while to get here, obviously, for obvious reasons, but we are here in Mantova for the MXGP of Cheetah di Mantova. It's hard to believe that the MXGP class is coming down to the final round. It's so rare for a championship fight to actually come down to the final round or moto, let alone it be this close. We've got three riders who can win this thing quite easily. They're all capable, they've all proven they're capable. There is no way to predict how this thing is going to go, and that means it's an exciting time to be a fan. I've been really impressed with Fevre this season. No matter what happens, no matter if he wins this championship or not, this has been a real resurgence for him. He's going to have to go through Jeffrey Hurlings, and that's a rider that no one wants to face in a title battle. People from the outside see him as quite a special guy. I mean, one that's maybe quite hard to, to crack, let's say, and kind of work out. Um, for me, I, when I was in the 250, uh, I was able to train with him together with Jackie and yeah, we just got along good. I mean, there was no competition between us, you know, we was in separate classes and yeah, just had a great friendship actually and was able to, to, to work together really good, you know, on the track, off the track with cycling and yeah, I think he was, he's one of those guys for me who is, is straight, he's not a, uh, it's not about all the bullshit of you, you need to be uh, on this program and eating this and he's just straight, he, he focuses on his job and, and gets it done. I came there and I knew this guy became world champion so he's, he's good at something, you know, so I tried to, to watch him and see what he does and he did a uh, two-hit thing, this is what I learned, like didn't matter what happened, who was there, what influenced him negative things, he just followed his path and he didn't turn left or right for anybody, he just hold his line and I think that's yeah what, what is making him good. And Talking to uh, other riders about you, they think that your two strengths are being mentally strong and also your aggression, um, would you agree with that? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, no, I agree. Uh, uh, and like you say also, I had some ma many bad years, uh, bad injury, and sometimes I wasn't good enough. And uh, I came, yeah, I came back to fight and to, to, yeah, to be just better every year. And um, seems, yeah, this year it's working pretty well, but uh, yeah, you, 
uh, you don't know what's gonna happen, you know. Uh, sometimes you can, uh, tomorrow I can get injured uh, in two weeks or whatever. It's just uh, you have to be really strong mentally. It's what, uh, it's what um, I think I, I am. And uh, yeah, you have to have some aggression also on the track to, to, yeah, to fight for the, the first position. Coming into the final race then, Jeffrey Hurlings, Roman Fevre, they are tied on points. The only other time we have seen this, 1988, the 125 season, Jean-Michel Bayern and Dave Strybos. After race one, going into the final round, both riders were tied for the lead with just one race remaining. Bale won from Strybos to win the championship by three. Who is it going to be today though? Fans on their feet. The anticipation is through the roof. We've got a green flag for the final time this year. The Fly Racing 15 second board is up. Next GP, race two is gone. A good jump once again, and it's Fevra who squeezes Hurlings to the inside. Jorge Prado once again. And the top two in the championship, Lina Stern, as they go through there, and also Geiser splits. Fevra and Hurlings is a direct shootout between the top two in the world right now. Roman Fevra and Jeffrey Hurlings by leading Hurlings. Hurlings finds his way past. The fans have got exactly what they want to see. Oh, Fevra is down, coming out of the turn. It's hard and slick there as well. Jeffrey Hurlings a lap away from taking his fifth world title. Jeffrey Hurlings out of the final turn is the 2021 MXGP world champion. He joins Roger De Costa, Joe Robert, Georges Jobet, Joe Smets as a five-time world champion. A lot of people wanted to know what I would have done if I didn't win this championship this year again. I guess you'll never know. <laughs> there you have it then. Jeffrey Hurlings wins the 2021 MXGP title and deservedly so. For sure, um, but yeah, that's why I think it's uh, it's the hard way to to lose. But um, it's like it's like this. Um, yeah, I gave my all, and uh, yeah, at the moment it's really tough. But um, yeah, I will uh, go through and then uh, battle next year. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank the 2021 MXGP series is going to be remembered for a very long time. 2022 could be even better though. Jeffrey Hurlings is going to be back to defend his crown. Roman Fevre is going to come out with a vengeance. Tim Geiser is going to want to reclaim the crown that he's lost, and that's not even mentioning Jorge Prado, Jeremy Sewer, and Maxime Renault. The MX2 world champion is ditching his YZ250 FM and stepping up into the MXGP class for the first time with Monster Energy Yamaha Factory MXGP. There's something to be said about first. And for Pipeline, that was Phil Edwards. Before my time, Pipeline was thought to be unrideable. An 
uncapable force of nature. But like most things thought impossible, it was only a matter of time before a matador entered the bullring. A 10-foot self-shaped single fin was Phil's projectile of choice. For the time, it's not like there were any other options. He yearned for glory, but was stoked on survival. The unrightable wave had been ridden, although far from tame. Phil didn't know it at the time, but he had just changed the world of surfing forever. March 22nd, 1765. Britain enacts the Stamp Act to raise money from its American colonies. But the colonies balk at taxation without representation, and the act is repealed the next year. The conflict helps set the stage for the American Revolution in the following decade. 1987. A barge carrying 3,200 tons of garbage leaves New York's Long Island on a six-month journey in search of a place to unload. Several states and three countries turn away the so-called garbage barge before space is found, back where the journey began. 1997. Tara Lipinski becomes the youngest women's world figure skating champion at age 14 years and 10 months. I never expected it, and especially not this year. Going into Worlds, you know, I was just thinking about my skating and... It was a big shock, but I love it. <laughs> 1963. The Beatles released their first album, Please Please Me, in Britain. And 1948. Also in Britain, composer Andrew Lloyd Webber is born in London. Among his musicals, Jesus Christ Superstar, Evita, Cats, and The Phantom of the Opera. Today in History, March 22nd, Sandy Cosell, The Associated Press. Welcome back in our studio and in today's news, 